started. We're having a little uh, screen trouble. They're doing a reset. It's going to take about two minutes to get it set up. But I thought while that was going on, um, I would make a couple of announcements. A lot of energy in here today. Uh, one of the announcements being that um, I will um, have a review session uh, tonight at 5 p.m. in ALS 4001. So um, I will videotape that and yes I will get it posted as quickly as I can as including today's lecture. I will get them both posted as quickly as I can. Uh, as you can imagine it takes a while to get these things done so I appreciate your patience but I will I know that you're trying to study hard and I want, I want you to have the materials uh, to study for the exam. The exam uh, in here will be on Friday um, and as I said in the first five rows you can sit anywhere you want to but after the first five rows I want you to sit in every other seat and so if you come in with the following seating you'll save time and we'll be able to get the full 50 minutes so let, please pay attention to what I'm getting ready to tell you the way I want you to seat uh, is in the odd numbered seats well, how do we know the odd numbered seats number one for this group will be this far seat one three five seven okay now if you see somebody sitting in two don't go sit in four because then you're all gonna have to get up okay so you're gonna sit in one three if somebody sitting in two you sit in three you'll be fine I'll move the person in two right okay so one three five this one will start right here so you have a one right there for that one this one one that's true in the back as well okay one three five seven nine everybody with me it's after row five okay and you guys can probably figure this one out over here. Number one will be right here, one, three, five, seven, nine. Okay? Now, if you come in and you sit properly, as I said, it'll be very easy to get started. We'll get the exams passed out. You'll have 50 minutes and we'll, we'll get you all going. Okay? Everybody understand? Okay. Come on here. Sit two minutes. I don't see it. Yes, Kevin, in um, uh, uh, link 128, um, I saw the big screen turn blue and then that went out, the, bla the, the touch screen on the front is black and nothing is responding. Nope. I saw blue earlier, but then when you reset it, but then, nothing, then that went away. Oh, now, now it's come up. Now it's come up. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay. We'll try it again. Um, let's see. All right, so let me tell you, it's much easier to lecture with the materials in front of me than otherwise. So um, let's see. Yes, okay, so I'm going to finish up. Let me, let me tell you what I'm going to do on the exam also. So shh. I'm going to talk about the exam. All right, uh, so today I'm going to talk through the synthesis of cholesterol okay I'm also going to cover something I meant to cover the other day on the um, um, uh, superoxide dismutase that I did not cover I'm gonna go back and cover that as well and then the material will stop so I'll note in the lecture where that'll stop I'll also note in the highlights where that will stop okay all right so before I talk about cholesterol metabolism I want to go back to the previous lecture and talk about something I overlooked and I didn't mean to do that and that had to do with reactive oxygen species. I mentioned them briefly and I said that reactive oxygen species happen when we get oxygen that is incompletely reduced. Now incompletely reduced oxygen can come in a variety of forms. The most common uh, one that we see um, that's a big problem is called superoxide and superoxide is a molecular oxygen that is O2 that has an extra electron and as I noted last time um, unpaired electrons for anything or uh, for any of the biomolecules that we talk about are definitely problematic and they're problematic because they react very readily one of the things that happens with superoxide is it'll react with the first thing it hits okay well if the first thing it hits is a nucleotide of DNA then you've just formed the basis for making a mutation. If it's hitting the active site of a protein, it might be knocking out the enzymatic activity associated with that protein. Okay? 
So there's all kinds of problems that happen with reactive oxygen species and consequently cells go to extraordinary measures um, to prevent the formation of reactive oxygen species. One of the things that can happen with superoxide, we'll talk about this later in the term actually, is it can react with nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a signaling molecule used in our cells and form this very reactive molecule called peroxynitrite. And peroxynitrite, like superoxide, is also very reactive and can cause some significant problems uh, for cells. So cells, as I said, go to um, extraordinary lengths to prevent uh, the proliferation and the action of superoxides, a reactive oxygen species. So I mentioned earlier that there are some antioxidants that cells have. I mentioned vitamins C and E. Vitamin A may well have some um, uh, antioxidant properties. And the molecule I couldn't remember the other day that I was thinking of, I kept saying urea, and I knew it wasn't urea, and I couldn't pull it out of my head, is uric acid. So uric acid um, also is an interesting molecule with respect to um, antioxidant properties. And I'll actually talk about that when I talk about nucleotide metabolism. Uric oxide is involved in the um, uh, uh, disease known as gout. Okay? So it forms crystals in nerve cells and those crystals can be very, very painful. And the place where the crystals form is the lowest place in your body. So it's commonly in your big toe. Um, and um, I'll talk more about that later. In addition to the chemical protectants that the body has, and glutathione, by the way, is another one that's there. Uh, I don't say too much about it here, but glutathione is a very important antioxidant for cells to protect them. Uh, cells also have enzymes, and two of the most important enzymes that cells have uh, are catalase and superoxide dismutase. Now, catalase uh, is important because it uh, favors uh, the reduction of um, hydrogen peroxide and our cells are full of it. So one of the reasons that hydrogen peroxide is uh, protective um, is because we have catalase that breaks it down and bacteria don't. So catal uh, the hydrogen peroxide being a reactive oxygen species, even though it's a stable molecule, is very reactive. And catalase helps protect our cells against it. We don't want to have too much of it, obviously. We're not going to take a bath in catalase. Uh, but bacteria don't have that protection. You can tell that you have protection by virtue of the fact that if you take hydrogen peroxide and you put it on your finger, you'll see bubbles form. And the bubble f bubbles forming are actually oxygen that's being produced by action of the catalase enzyme. So that's in a very important protection that you have against a molecule that's fairly reactive. Now, if we look at the action of catalase, the reaction that it catalyzes is shown right here. There's hydrogen peroxide, and hydrogen peroxide is broken down by the enzyme to form molecular oxygen. As I said, that's the bubbling that you see that happens when you put um, hydrogen peroxide on your finger, or any other part of your body for that matter. Glutathione, um, I'll just show you this. You're not responsible for the structure, but glutathione is a molecule that has um, a sulfhydryl that um, protects cells by donating electrons, and when it donates electrons, it becomes oxidized, and the oxidation of glutathione forms this dimer that's right here. You can see the disulfide bond, and the disulfide bond is a very common uh, thing for uh, molecules with sulfhydryls to form. Last term, you learned about the amino acid cysteine, which has a sulfhydryl, and you probably learned also about cystine, C-Y-S-T-I-N-E, and that's made by putting two cysteines together and making a disulfide bond just like you see here with glutathione. So uh, glutathione, as I say, is a chemical protectant. It's not enzymatic uh, in any way. The last enzyme I want to mention is a very interesting one, though. It's superoxide dismutase. And superoxide dismutase, as you can see uh, in this reaction, catalyzes a two-step um, reaction. Um, I don't know if Dr. McFadden talked about ping-pong reactions last term. Did you guys learn about ping-pong reactions? Okay. So ping-pong reactions involve enzyme converting between two different forms. And that's the ping and the pong. First form catalyzes one thing and the enzyme gets converted into another configuration. That other configuration catalyzes the second part and then it flips back to the first. And so we see those two things um, that are happening uh, right here. Uh, superoxide dismutase takes uh, this uh, uh, 
process here and converts. We don't actually see the second one for the superoxide uh, dismutase in this one. But we see the superoxide dismutase can take hydrogen peroxide, and, I'm sorry, can take superoxide and form hydrogen peroxide. And it does that by um, a reaction uh, that's actually shown right here. So this is the ping-pong nature of the superoxide dismutase. And we can see what's happening. We see the superoxide, and we see the superoxide dismutase has an enzyme that contains a copper in the plus two state when the extra electron that's on this superoxide is taken away, the copper becomes in the plus one state, okay, and we're left with molecular oxygen. We'd say, well, that's great. We'll just stop right there. Well, we can't stop right there because the enzyme is in this state where it's got this extra electron. And so getting rid of that electron is the pong part of the ping pong. We've seen the ping part of the reaction up here. The pong part of the reaction now involves the return of the enzyme to the original state, and that means that this electron that it gained must be lost. And so it's lost by the enzyme donating the electron to another superoxide. And the other superoxide here, and now we've got an oxygen that has two extra electrons, and those two extra electrons on that oxygen pick up two protons, and that's how hydrogen peroxide is actually formed. So on that previous slide where you saw hydrogen peroxide, it's a two-step process to get to the hydrogen peroxide. And the enzyme is left now back in the ping state back up here. Now I know I'm going through that a little fast, so I'll slow down and take any questions you have about that. Understand the, the two steps that's happening. First, the enzyme takes the electron. Then the enzyme donates the electron to another superoxide. So there's two superoxides that are dealt with by this enzyme. This enzyme is interesting for a couple of other reasons. One I mentioned in class the other day, and that is that this enzyme has the fastest known rate of any enzyme. Okay? the fastest known rate of any enzyme. And if you think about it, being fast is really, really important because superoxides are not something the cell wants to have around for any period of time. As I've told you, they'll react with the first thing that they run into. So hopefully the first thing that they're running into is this enzyme. And this enzyme is converting them into um, a form that's not problematic. It's making, in this case, hydrogen peroxide, but since you have catalase to deal with hydrogen peroxide, this can be dealt with. Hydrogen peroxide is much less reactive than superoxide is. So you've taken something that's very reactive, made it into something that's less reactive, and then catalase can take that and convert it into water and oxygen. Now, that's one reason this enzyme is interesting and important. The other is that for any of you who have ever heard of Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, this is a complicated uh, disease. It's studied by Dr. Joe Beckman in the Linus Pauling Institute here at OSU. And there um, are different forms of the disease, but the form of the disease that is genetically transmitted is known to have a mutation in this enzyme. And so it's thought that um, problems arising with the accumulation of reactive oxygen species damage the nerve cells. And this is what gives rise to the phenomenon known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease is a very debilitating um, and progressive neurodegenerative um, disease. Um, it leaves people with uh, sequentially losing all muscular function. And, but the, um, the brain is still functioning. So it's uh, ultimately people who have this disease die, um, most commonly of respiratory problems because they can't breathe or swallow properly. Uh, Stephen Hawking is the most famous person to have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and his is very unusual in being stabilized at a point. Almost every other one get, goes to um, terminal um, state within a couple of years. So it's a very debilitating disease. Okay. Questions about that? Everybody's stunned to silence here. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to say that I meant to say the other day. I got started on it, and I didn't finish the uh, discussion of it. So I wanted to make sure I finish the discussion of that for you. Um, what I want to do here now is finish up 
the last of this metabolism, and as I said, that's going to go down here to bile acids, and then I'm going to stop at that point in terms of the material for this exam, um, and then I'll start talking about things that will be on the next exam. Well, last time I talked about the synthesis of sphingolipids, the last of the membrane lipids that I'll be talking about here um, includes cholesterol. So cholesterol, you may recall, um, is a steroid. It is a precursor of all of the steroid hormones. And it is also an important component of membranes. This molecule, which has a fairly elaborate structure, that again, I'm not asking you to memorize, um, can be made entirely from acetyl-CoA. It's entirely made from acetyl-CoA. So the cholesterol that we have in our body is there partly by synthesis, partly by uh, diet, and partly by storage. We actually store um, a form of cholesterol, and I won't go into that, but there are three different ways in which our body has cholesterol. Cholesterol, as I noted, is very important, and it's, uh, in uh, brain cells, for example, as I noted, 14 to 16 percent of the dry weight of brain is actually comprised of cholesterol. So it's important that we understand <coughs> excuse me, how uh, cholesterol is synthesized. If we look at this, we can see the blue carbon right there, and we see the red carbon, and we see where they all end up in that molecule. And we're going to see that happen. It's not gonna, we're not going to go through every step of it, obviously, because there are quite a few steps involved. But we will go through the highlights of that. So to synthesize a cholesterol, we start with um, acetyl-CoA. We start with two acetyl-CoA, and we make a molecule called acetoacetyl-CoA. Anybody remember where they've seen that before? Ketone body synthesis. Very good. You're studying for your exam. Addition of a third acetyl-CoA gives you a six-carbon molecule known as HMG-CoA. Okay? HMG-CoA, as I noted in class when I talked about ketone body synthesis, is a branch point between the synthesis of ketone bodies, which I show going down here, and the synthesis of cholesterol, which moves upwards and toward the right. Okay? So if we go in the direction of making cholesterol, the enzyme that converts HMG-CoA into mevalonate is a very, very, very important enzyme. Okay? It's known as HMG-CoA reductase. HMG-CoA reductase. That's an enzyme name you should have in your heads. Okay? Why? Well, it turns out that for one reason, obviously, it's catalyzing the first step, first reaction on the pathway to making cholesterol. It turns out also to be the enzyme in cholesterol synthesis that is regulated. Okay? Whenever we have regulated enzymes, we realize the importance of them in stopping or starting an entire pathway from uh, reacting. This um, enzyme is complicated in its regulation. I'm not going to take you through all the regulation. It's involved, it's regulated both covalently and also by allosteric interactions. And the allosteric interactions are the ones that we're interested in here because this enzyme is inhibited by the product of the pathway, specifically cholesterol. So HMG-CoA reductase is feedback inhibited by its own pathway. That is, cholesterol inhibits it. Well, in a perfect world, everything is fine and dandy. If the cell doesn't have enough cholesterol, then the enzyme is not inhibited, and all these reactions occur, and the cell makes as much cholesterol as it needs. And if the cell starts accumulating too much cholesterol, then cholesterol feeds back, inhibits this enzyme, and stops further synthesis. Okay? There's a lot more to cholesterol in the body than what happens inside of an individual cell. When we think about cholesterol problems, they're generally associated with things outside of cells, not inside of cells. Okay? So we think of atherosclerosis and things like that that block blood flow and cause strokes and heart attack. Those are happening because of things that are happening outside of cells, specifically in arteries that are causing blocks or plugs to happen. Now, I'm not going to talk about that uh, um, for this exam. If I get time, I will talk about it after I finish the material for this exam. Otherwise, I'll talk about it next time, uh, next lecture. 
All right, well, let's go back and let's follow this pathway. So if we go from uh, HMG-CoA uh, to mevalonate, um, mevalonate gets decarboxylated. Okay. Now, I'm not asking you to memorize the structures, but you should know mevalonate's got six carbons, and loss of carbon dioxide through decarboxylation leads to formation of a molecule that has five carbons. Six minus one equals five, right? Well, the molecule that's made is called IPP, you're welcome to call it that, or isopentanyl pyrophosphate, it's full name, okay? Isopentanyl pyrophosphate is an example of a class of molecules that we call isoprenes. I-S-O-P-R-E-N-E. -E. Isoprenes are five carbon molecules. One of them is IPP. The other one is this guy over here called DMAPP, D-M-A-P-P, -P, or dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. And I imagine you'll call it D-M-A-P-P, -P, and that's perfectly fine. Okay. DMAPP is readily made from IPP. As you can see, they're readily interconverted. We're going to see that these two five carbon units are put together to make cholesterol. So the function of acetyl-CoA has been to make these five carbon isoprene units. They're both isoprenes. To make these isoprene units, and we're now in the next phase of cholesterol synthesis going to put those five carbon units together to make cholesterol. Now let's see how that happens. Okay. Here are the five carbon units that we made in the last process. And now we start putting them together. And to be honest with you, I don't care if you know which ones go in where, as long as you know that you have five carbon units. Because this becomes the easy part of cholesterol biosynthesis, guys. If I take a five carbon unit and a five carbon unit and I put them together, what am I going to have? A 10 carbon unit. Math is good, right? The 10 carbon unit has a name, geronyl pyrophosphate. Yeah, the name's important. Geronyl pyrophosphate has 10 carbons. If I take a 10 carbon unit and I add another 5 carbon unit, I'm going to have something that has 15 carbons. And that also has an important name, farnesyl pyrophosphate. So farnesyl pyrophosphate has 15 carbons. If I take two 15 carbon units of farnesyl pyrophosphate and put them together, I make something that has 30 carbons. That's known as squalene. And that's also an important name. And the fact that it has 30 carbons is also important. We're nearing the end of what we're going to talk about. If I take squalene and I rearrange it by twisting single bonds and making covalent bonds between adjacent carbons, I can create something that kind of looks like cholesterol. And that molecule, excuse me, is called linosterol. So linosterol, no surprise, has 30 carbons. Linosterol looks like cholesterol. It's what we call the first cyclic intermediate because we've made cycles right here, cyclic ring structures. Squalene is the last of the linear molecules. So we have linear squalene, we have cyclic linosterol. Now if you look at the structure of linosterol and you compare it to that of cholesterol, they're very similar. But it turns out to get from linosterol to cholesterol requires 19 steps. Okay, 19 steps to get from linosterol to cholesterol. Many of those require ATP. This means that the synthesis of cholesterol is very energy demanding. And the cell doesn't want to be making cholesterol if it doesn't need it because it's going to be wasting a lot of energy. And it's for that reason that the feedback inhibition of HMG-CoA reductase is so important because it stops the synthesis before all this other stuff accumulates and the cells aren't wasting energy on things that they don't need. Okay. It makes sense. So two five carbon units make a 10. 10 plus 5 gives us 15. Two 15s give us 30. 
30 gives us squalene, which is made into linosterol, and you've made a whole cholesterol from all of those acetyl-CoAs. Pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable that we've been able to do that. Okay. Well, cholesterol, as I noted before, is, um, and, um, oh, by the way, here's um, our shortcut here, 19 steps, right? When I was in graduate school, I had to memorize those 19 steps. Let me tell you, that's not a fun thing to do. Thank you, Kevin. We're happy you don't make us do that. Okay. Now, I've mentioned before that cholesterol is an important precursor of the steroid hormones. I mentioned five classes uh, of steroid hormones. Um, these included the um, uh, androgens, the estrogens, the mineralocorticoids, the glucocorticoids, and the um, uh, uh, progest uh, progestogens, the uh, ones related to progesterone. So those are the five categories of steroid hormone. And I also mentioned how the um, uh, uh, androgens could be converted into estrogens by this aromatase. And I won't go through that again, but you can see that reaction actually going right here. Um, the other thing that's on this figure that you should know something about is the fact that cholesterol, in addition to being a precursor for the steroid hormones, is also a precursor for the bile acids. And as the name suggests, they are, in fact, acids. They are, um, uh, they are commonly combined with, uh, they combine molecules with cholesterol to put an acid on there and make the cholesterol be much more polar on a part of the molecule. Well, if you do that, you've created an amphiphilic molecule. And amphiphilic molecules are really important for a variety of things. One, we've talked about the lipid bilayer containing amphiphilic molecules. And second, the other thing that's important for amphiphilic molecules are detergents. So soap and things like that are made of amphiphilic fatty acids, part of them nonpolar, part of them polar. Bile acids also have a part of them polar, the acid part. And part of them nonpolar, the ring part of cholesterol. Well, why do I tell you that? Well, it turns out that bile acids, because they're amphiphilic, act like detergents. And what do detergents do? They solubilize things that are nonpolar in an aqueous environment. Okay? Why do we care about that? Well, think of all the fat you eat in a McDonald's hamburger or any food that you eat. Okay? That insoluble fat has got to be solubilized so that your body can use it. And that happens as a result of action of bile acids in your stomach. So bile acids in your stomach solubilize fat and allow the body to use it by putting it into a form that is dissolved in water. And that's important in your digestive system. Okay. I hear a yawn. Oh, man. A lot of material. Well, the good news about the material is that's the end of the material for exam one. Yay! End of the material for exam one. Okay, I, I think I actually have some bile acid structures. Just so you can see them, you're not going to memorize those, but you can see um, that's actually the steroid synthesis. It, no need, no need to worry about that. Okay, so we finished the material for exam one. Exam two material will start right here where it says dietary lipid movement in the body. And the bile acids that I talked about are a perfect transition to talking about this here because we begin to realize that nonpolar things like fats, fat soluble vitamins, and other lipids need to be managed in the body because we are 75% water. So how do we manage to deal with these things that are water insoluble in this very rich aqueous environment that comprises us? Well, it turns out um, that the process starts in our diet with the movement of material across the intestinal wall. Okay? That's how the overall process starts. So we eat something, 
it goes into our digestive system. Bile acids in the stomach help to solubilize it, which is important for it to be able to move through the uh, digestive system. But at some point, it has to get into the rest of our body. So how does that happen? Well, this figure shows the start of that process by how it is, for example, that fat is processed. Okay? Fat is actually moved across the intestinal wall in a very odd process. Okay? Fat, you remember, of course, is a triacylglycerol. It's a glycerol with three fatty acids on it. Right? To move that across the um, intestinal wall, okay, and this is the wall right here. Here's the lumen, meaning it's the inside part of the intestine. In the lumen, two of the fatty acids are removed from the fat, leaving behind a monoacylglycerol and free fatty acids. And those get moved across the membrane separately, and then when they get across that barrier, they get reassembled into fat. So the pieces are taken apart, moved across, and then they're reassembled. Not completely clear why that's the case, but I can give you a hint based on what I've already been saying, and that is this. Fatty acids are amphiphilic molecules. What do amphiphilic molecules do? They help with solubilization of things, and it may well be that this process actually facilitates the solubilization of things in the intestine. Okay? That's just one idea, but it may be that that um, is helpful in that process. In any event, once they get across the intestinal wall, then they are reassembled into triacylglycerol, so we have fat. So now we've got a real problem in the sense that over here in the intestine we had bile acids that were helping to solubilize this stuff, and over here on the other side of the intestine, we don't have that. Okay? So outside of the intestine, the body has complexes that it uses to package these things up. So the first thing that happens is these triacylglycerols and so forth will get passed into the lymphatic system, packaged up in complexes we call chylomicrons. So these guys here are complexed up with molecules called chylomicrons. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay? And the chylomicrons pass into the lymph system and ultimately into the bloodstream. We're going to follow that pathway. Everybody with me? Fat in the diet, fat moved across the intestine as monoacylglycerols and fatty acids. Fat is remade, it's packaged up with chylomicrons, and the chylomicrons get dumped into the lymph system and ultimately into the bloodstream. That's what's happening with movement of lipids. Now, I don't show you, for example, fat-soluble vitam uh, fat vitamins, but they also travel by a similar pathway. I won't go through those here. Okay? Fat-soluble vitamins also have to be packaged up in chylomicrons and other lipid substances for the body to use that come from the diet also have to be packaged up in chylomicrons. Okay? So chylomicrons are important complexes that function as part of dietary lipid movement. Well, that brings me to um, the next topic. And how am I doing on time? OK, I've got plenty of time. Uh, my next topic, which are, are uh, what are called the um, uh, lipoprotein complexes. OK? Lipoprotein complexes. All right? <coughs> Excuse me. An apolipoprotein complex is something that just doesn't have um, other things associated with it. But for our purpose, we just talk, I, I talk about them all the same way. They're lipoprotein complexes. What are lipoprotein complexes? Well, the name, again, tells you what it is. Lipo, referring to lipid. Protein, referring to protein. And complexes, meaning mesh together. Well, how does that work? Well, if we think about it, a lipoprotein complex has lipids as part of it so that it can help to solubilize the lipids it's binding to. These are complexes. They form little balls. OK? 
Okay? On the inside of the ball, that's where the lipid part of the lipoprotein complex is found. On the outside part of the complex, that's where the protein is that's going to interact with the aqueous environment. So these lipoprotein complexes are acting like big detergents. And I say big because these are pretty good sized things. Okay? These are pretty good sized things. Let's take a look at one of them. Okay? If we look at chylomicrons, for example, we can see schematically what I've been talking about. Here are the protein part, okay? phospholipids on the outside. All right? Specifically, they're going to have proteins with phosphate groups on there, and the lipid portion on the inside, the nonpolar part on the inside. And that's where all of the dietary lipid is going to be contained. So we have a nonpolar environment on the inside, a polar environment on the outside. Okay? These guys are the biggest complexes of all the ones I'm going to talk about. And I like to think of them as big, fluffy complexes. Yes, Rania? Chylomicrons contain lipoproteins. So there are individual lipoproteins, okay? And chylomicrons are a type of lipoprotein complex. So we, we will see, if you look back at that last figure, you'll see there's many lipoproteins. I'm not going to go into much detail on those. But there are many lipoproteins, and different complexes contain different lipoproteins. So chylomicrons are a type of lipoprotein complex. We'll see other types, including HDLs, high-density lipoproteins, okay? LDLs, low-density lipoprotein complexes, and others that I'll talk about. Okay? But these are all complexes, and those complexes may contain a variety of different lipoproteins. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so all the lipoprotein complexes have a general structure like this. They may be comprised of different individual lipoproteins, but they all have a general structure like this because what they're doing is that they're carrying this nonpolar stuff in the aqueous, <coughs> excuse me, in the aqueous environment of our bloodstream. Okay? In the case of chylomicrons, they're actually carrying it in the lymph system, but it's also an aqueous environment. Okay. And we can see in here, um, I've marked some of these things that you can see. All the Fs refer to fats. Okay. Uh, C's and V's and other things, V being vat, fat soluble vitamins, C's being cholesterol is also carried in these little complexes and um, that's how they're moved in the body. You can see individual lipoproteins and I'm not going to ask you to memorize which one goes where. Okay. Let's see. Now, I'm going to briefly go through this. There's a lot of information here. I'm going to briefly go through this with you today, okay? And then I'm going to review that next time, okay? Because there's a lot of information that's here that's important to understand, okay? So far, what have we done? We have gone, we've had dietary lipid. The dietary lipid got packaged up into chylomicrons, okay? And the chylomicrons are going to go out and do their thing. Well, I'm going to follow first this green pathway down here, okay? So let's follow what happens going down here. I'm not going to talk about this at the moment, but I'm going to talk about this down here. Chylomicrons, I said they go in the lymph system. They exit the lymph system and they go into the bloodstream. So we've got chylomicrons carrying these lipids that enter the bloodstream. And they're the biggest, fluffiest things of all of the complexes. So you say, aha, I know what causes atherosclerosis because atherosclerosis involves blockages of the bloodstream. These guys are the biggest ones. They must be the ones. Uh, no. Okay. What happens with the chylomicrons? Chylomicrons are because they're so big, they hit the capillaries in your bloodstream and they get stuck. 
And that also sounds like we got problems, right? But they're getting stuck is part of their function. They're too big to pass through the capillaries, and the capillaries are generally where the nutrients are needed the most. That's why they're capillaries. So they can have a lot of surface area for the oxygen to diffuse. Muscle tissue, for example, will have a lot of capillaries. All right? These chylomicron complexes that contain all these lipids are stuck. And what happens when they get stuck is that these cells at the place where this sticking occurs secrete lipases. What do lipases do? Lipases break down fats and or glycerol phospholipids. And what happens is that chylomicron, which is just full of fat and other things inside of it, starts to shrink because the things inside of it start to be digested. And as it shrinks, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, creating what we call a chylomicron remnant, which is what you see right here. And it becomes small enough that it passes through the capillaries. And it floats merrily along its way in the bloodstream until it gets back to the liver. And the liver grabs it and absorbs it. Okay? So we've just followed a fat from our, from our mouth to our intestines to the lymph system in the chylomicrons, to our tissues, and now whatever's left inside of there goes back to the liver. Remember I said that the chylomicron remnant can have cholesterol in it. Stopping here at the capillaries doesn't transfer any of the cholesterol to those cells. Okay? So all the cholesterol that was in the diet here makes it all the way back to the liver. And the liver is really important. You learned last term that the liver was important for sugar metabolism. All right? The liver is important. It's critical, we're going to see, for cholesterol regulation in the body. And we'll also see the liver plays a role in fats and fatty acid metabolism. Okay? So the liver is really critical. The liver has, and it has to have, some capacity to store cholesterol. What happens if we exceed the capacity of the liver to store cholesterol? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I'll tell you, your blood cholesterol levels are going to rise. If you know somebody who has high cholesterol levels, okay, first thing a doctor is going to try to do is try to get the levels down by changing diet. Okay? Because if they're exceeding capacities, then changing diet will help a lot. That doesn't always work, okay? So then there's drugs that come in. And here's one other thing that you're responsible for knowing from last, for, for, the, for the first exam. I forgot to mention it, but I'll mention it here because it's very relevant. How do we lower cholesterol levels with a drug? Well, there are drugs called statins, S-T-A-T-I-N-S, -T and statins are inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase, the enzyme that's regulated in cholesterol biosynthesis. Statins are inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase, the enzyme that's necessary for making that. Okay? Everybody with me? So that enzyme is important. Okay, well we followed what's happened now with one of the um, pathways of movement of cholesterol in the body. But we can see that there's other things that happen. Okay? Other things that happen, all right? They mostly come from the liver. There's this one little side pathway, and all that's happening in this side pathway is that free fatty acids are gobbled up by adipose tissue. So the free fatty acids are coming from action of lipases, okay? And that's basically what's happening right here. I'll talk about the HDLs later, okay? Adipose tissue, of course, are the cells of the body that store the fat, okay? That's critical. 
Free fatty acids turn out to be a FFA, not the future farmers of America, but rather free fatty acids. Okay? Free fatty acids are a real problem for the body. Anybody know why free fatty acids are a real problem for the body? Anybody? Is anybody awake? Everybody's just shy. How about if I gave one point of extra credit for whoever got the correct answer for this? Well, nonpolar, but that's not, yeah, yes and no. There's more to it than that. I see a hand, you want to put the hand up. Well, you're, that's related to her. Is the answer no? Rania? Well, they can affect membranes, but that's not the problem. No. Nice try. Yes? When, why is that a problem? No. Because what? That they're what? They're large? No, no, because they're large. All right, I'm going to have to tell you guys. All right. What did I say that fatty acids were important for making? Well, besides fat. <laughs> when I talk about bile acids, what were I, what, why was that relevant? No, I, was, I talked about detergents, right? Fatty acids are needed to make soaps and detergents. Why do you wash your hands with detergent? Or why, wash your hand with soap? You can kill bacteria. And how do you kill bacteria? By denaturing their proteins. Do you want to have a bunch of things denaturing your proteins floating around your, blood, your bloodstream? No, you don't. That's why you have the most abundant protein in your bloodstream. Do you know what it is? Serum albumin. And one of the functions of serum albumin is carrying free fatty acids so they don't cause problems. Okay, that's a lot of material. It's time for a song. And I want to hear, you guys sang very well last time. I want to hear you sing today. This is a fun one to sing. It's called Superoxide Dismutase. It's to the tune of supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. When oxygen's electrons all are in the balanced state, there's 12 of them for O2. The molecule is great. But problems happen sometimes on the route to complex four, making reactive species that the cell cannot ignore. Oh, superoxide dismutase is super catalytic, keeping cells from getting very peri peroxynitritic. Faster than a radical, its actions are terrific. Superoxide dismutase is super catalytic. Enzyme, enzyme deep inside, blocking all the bad oxides. The enzyme's main advantage is it doesn't have to wait for binding superoxide in a near transition state. It turns it to an oxygen in mechanism one, producing H2O2 when the cycle is all done. Oh, superoxide dismutase, you're faster than all them. You got the highest ratio of KCAT over KM. This means that superoxide cannot cause too much mayhem. Superoxide dismutase is faster than all them. Oh, superoxide dismutase, stopping superoxide's ways. The enzyme's like a ping pong ball that mechanistically bounces between two copper states plus one and two you see. So SOD behaves just like an antioxidant, giving as much protection as a cell could ever want. Oh, superoxide dismutase, the cell's in love with you because you let electron transport do what it must do without accumulation of a radical O2. Superoxide dismutase, that's why a cell loves you. Review session at 5 tonight, ALS 4001.